Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 11th webinar of 2021 in the ACCP Immunology and Transplant PRM webinar series. I'm Chris Enser. I'm the Clinical Chief uh, and Manager for Academic Affairs at Evan Health Orlando, and it's my pleasure to moderate today. Today's webinar is entitled Updates and Desensitization, and we are honored to have Drs. Moses Demain and Ashley Vo present for us today. Dr. Devane is a transplant clinical pharmacy specialist at the University of Maryland Medical Center, and he rotates through abdominal and cardiothoracic transplant services and takes care of both inpatients and outpatients. He spends the majority of his time looking after heart transplant recipients, uh, and he completed his PharmD at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy and two years of residency training at UPMC Presbyterian in Pittsburgh. His research areas include <clears throat> desensitization, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and invasive fungal infections in solid organ transplantation. Dr. Vo is the Administrative Director of the Transplant Immunotherapy Program at the Comprehensive Transplant Center at Cedar sinai Medical Center and Professor of Pediatrics at the David Jeffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dr. Vo completed her PharmD at the University of Southern California and Pharmacy Practice and Specialty Residency Training at Cedar sinai Dr. Vo's research has advanced the field of desensitization for highly sensitized kidney transplant candidates, and she has developed novel therapeutics for the prevention and treatment of AMR in kidney transplant recipients. Dr. Vo directs the clinical research group in the kidney transplant program at Cedars and serves as a reviewer for transplantation, the American Journal of Transplantation, the JI, and others. Dr. Vo has published most notably in the New England Journal of Medicine, Transplantation, and the American Journal of Transplantation. Dr. Vo was awarded the AST Clinician of Distinction in 2014 and was elected fellow of the AST in 2016. We certainly are um, ple pleased to have such a distinguished panel. A few quick notes. Um, if you have questions for the speaker, please submit your question in the chat on the left side of your screen and send the question to the presenter group. We will take questions at the end of the debate. There will be an evaluation for this webinar at its conclusion. We encourage you to complete this to let us know how we're doing and uh, where we can improve on webinars going forward. The slides from today's presentation will be posted on the ACCP website in the section titled Webinar Slides after the presentation. I'm going to stick a sock in my mouth and turn it over to Drs. Demain and Vo. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction, Chris. Um, again, my name is Moses, and today we'll be talking about updates and desensitization strategies. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And the only disclaimer I have is I'm not an immunologist. But I'm going to pretend to be one today, so bear with me. In terms of our objectives, we'll start out by talking about sensitization and how it's measured. We'll talk about the impacts of sensitization and transplant outcomes. And last but not least, we'll discuss the populations that might potentially benefit from desensitization. Let's begin. So what is sensitization? This facial expression is all too common when sensitization comes up, either in rounds, or in patient selection meetings, or with learners in general. And I think to some degree, it's rightfully so, because there are a lot of knowns and also a lot of unknowns. In terms of what we do know, uh, no presentation about allosensitization is complete without referencing the amazing work done by Dr. Spatel and Dr. Terasaki. This particular paper that we're talking about was the earliest report showcasing the importance of preformed antibodies in transplantation. So briefly, this essentially just showed that eight patients out of 195 patients with negative cross matches developed hyperacute rejection, whereas a whopping uh, 24 out of 30 with positive cross matches experience hyper acute rejection. Another thing that's notable about this paper is this is also one of the first reports that essentially showed uh, risk factors for our preformed antibodies because they noted patients that were multi paris and patients with re receiving secondary transplants were at higher risk for graft loss. So, the biology of um, antibody formation is very complex, but I'll do my due diligence to try to break it down as much as possible. Uh, to the audience, um, essentially, we all know that we have naive and we also have memory alloimmunity, uh, with alloimmunity being more robust. So we're just going to start out pretty briefly talking about uh, naive alloimmunity, and that starts in the presence or exposure to um, alloantigen. For our purposes, that could be either a class 1 or class 2 um, HLA. Once this occurs, typically, um, it requires T cell help for uh, B cell activation, and then once that happens, you have cl um, clonal pl um, proliferation, and then you have differentiation into memory B cells. It's important to note that without uh, T cell help, some of these B cells actually uh, become energic and become depleted. 
So with subsequent uh, exposure to either the same antigen or something similar, you can have essentially a more robust response. And that's denoted here with the yellow line showing more, uh, you see uh, your uh, uh, antigen anti uh, specific IgG that actually show uh, that the cells have undergone uh, clonal proliferation, have gone undergone somatic hypermutation, essentially an increase in affinity to bind um, to, the anti uh, to the antigens as much as possible. One thing that's important to note is that through this as well, you have formation of lung lit plasma cells. And these cells can be in different uh, uh, different um, um, compartments in the body. So essentially, it can be in the periphery. It can be um, in the bone marrow. And this becomes very important in terms of when we talk about targets of, of these antibody subtypes and also in terms of what we're uh, targets for desensitization in general. So what are risk factors for sensitization? Uh, we all know uh, the most common risk factors for sensitization. So I'm just going to go through them really quickly. So we know blood transfusions, pregnancy and previous transplants we mentioned uh, a few slides ago, our prior cardiac surgery or homographs, uh, mechanical circulatory devices, uh, especially VADs, and viral infections and vaccines. Especially in the COVID age, there's more and more reports um, and more concerns, especially in the PRNs talking about increased sensitization with the COVID vaccines. One thing I just wanted to point out is not all forms of sensitization are created equal as there are, there is emergent evidence to say uh, patients that are sensitized as a result of having VADs, for example, might not have as much of a deleterious effect as patients who are sensitized through other mechanisms. So how sensitization characterized? Uh, the three uh, 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 general ways of characterizing uh, sensitization, uh, they can either be broadly sensitized where a patient has multiple detectable anti-HLA antibodies, and this is regardless of strength of the titer. So essentially, you can just have a plethora of antibodies, but they might just have very, very low strength and low titer. The second method, um, uh, way of classifying antibody is um, highly sensitized, and these are detectable high strength titer of anti-HLA antibodies. So it could just be a couple, maybe one or two, but these are very, very high, and this may or may not increase the CPRA dependent on the, the population um, uh, uh, to kinetics. And last but not least, the worst combination is being highly and broadly sensitized, where you have multiple detectable high strands and high titer anti-HLA antibodies. So how is sensitization measured? Uh, there's been an evolution of assays over the past couple of years, uh, but for our purposes, which is going to focus mainly on the newer assays, I just want to give a historical perspective where the uh, earlier assays were uh, cell-based, and these were the complement-dependent cytotoxicity and also flow cytometry, whereas the newer assays that we typically use are a more so solid phase, and we're going to spend more time talking about the single antigen beads. So what are single antigen beads? Uh, single antigen beads are essentially cellularized HLA molecules that are bound to solid matrix. Essentially, the recipient serum, as the image shows to the, to closer to the right, is mixed with the beads. And these beads typically have a unique dye and they have a unique HLA antigen on the surface. So binding typically occurs and detection of antibody and reporter dye is done using a Luminex or some form of laser. And when this, is occur when, when this occurs, this is typically reported as a mean fluorescence intensity. And this typically represents the amount of antibody that's bound relative to the total antigen present. So it's telling you the degree of saturation. Uh, the biggest pro to this is the sem semi-quantitative and as, uh, enables us to actually assess baseline and post transmit response. This can also be used to complete virtual cross matches. And with more and more advances, we can actually have molecular um, genotyping as opposed to just serological. And this allows for better discrimination of the antigens and shared epitopes. One of the biggest cons to this is the fact that uh, a, mis a common misconception is MFIs usually used interchangeably as titers, and MFIs do not uh, necessarily correlate to titers but it's instead a measure of binding strength and beach saturation. The next assay we're gonna discuss is the complement binding assays. And this is a different iteration of the single antigen beads, but it's done typically to assess uh, complement fixation. So essentially, if you check in to see, uh, you're checking to see if any of the preformed antibodies are able to fix complement. The most common is C1Q, but there are others out there. There's C3D and there's also C4D. But for our purposes, we'll just focus more so on C1Q. And this, uh, one of the biggest pros for this, it allows you to detect antibodies that are capable of act activating complement 
and it doesn't uh, uh, require complement activation essentially like the CDC um, crossmatch does. The biggest con to this is that the in vitro effects may not necessarily correlate with the in vivo effects. And it's still possible to have AMR with C1Q negative antibodies. So panel reactive antibodies. I feel like everyone in the uh, audience should uh, be familiar with panel reactive antibodies. I just want to uh, clarify really quickly that uh, the panel reactive antibodies is in the CPRA, which is the calculated panel reactive antibodies, are slightly different. And the reason for this is um, allo um, antibody determination for, with the same antigen beads is used to calculate the calculated PRA, and this is plugged into the UNOS calculator. And the number that comes out typically is a range of a zero to 100, and that tells you essentially uh, how easy it is or how likely it is to find a, pay, uh, a, a donor in the population that's compatible with the recipient. One thing that's important to note about this is that the, uh, the antigens there are, are deemed unacceptable by a transplant center. So it all depends on the risk threshold or risk um, uh, tolerance, right, rather, for different centers. Some might deem MFIs of uh, 2,000 to 3,000 unacceptable. Some might be more adventurous and deem MFIs of greater than 5,000 more uh, uh, unacceptable. And the graphic to the right is just showing that with the advent of the different assays, essentially, we, like I mentioned before, the sensitivity and specificity improved with the Luminex assay. As you can see, the, the percentage of patients that were had a, a percent, uh, uh, 80% PRA increased significantly. And unfortunately, the time to spend on the wait list also increased. Excuse me. There we go. Apologies for that. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is serum dilutions. And serum dilutions are very important because the strength of high titer antibodies can be underestimated due to saturation of target antigens in the beads. So essentially, if all the beads are bound, if you still have circulated antibodies, these antibodies, this ex excess antibodies cannot be detected. So essentially, the titer is uh, the extent of to which antibody can be diluted with, before losing its ability to react to specific antigen. And in some patients, depending on if you have some form of interference, like prosome, for example, it might be on, you might not be able to determine the actual risk of the antibody that's formed. So what's typically done is using the same single antigen beads, uh, what's only different is the serum sa um, samples are diluted in different folds. So you might have a neat serum and then you dilute by four folds, 16 fold, eight, um, uh, 32, 64 uh, uh, as an example. And the biggest pro to this is you get better information with regards to titer. Remember I mentioned MFIs are not really a good correlation to titer, but by using serum dilutions, you might get better information with regards to titer. And this can also be used to determine if there's gonna be, uh, if response to the sensitization is likely. I'll direct your attention to the chart, uh, to the image to, towards the right. This was done by Tambor and colleagues, and they essentially showed that certain patients, depending on the titer, uh, might see different, uh, depending on the dilutions rather, might see different um, responses. So for example, patient two, which is P2 on the y-axis, uh, required about 16,000 fold dilution before they saw any response in, or any reduction in the CPRA. Whereas on the flip side, patient 20 at the very top uh, only required a four fold dilution before you can see some improvement. So this is one of the newer things that we're thinking about uh, utilizing as study endpoints. Uh, the biggest con to this, unfortunately, is the cost in terms of time and money. So now that we know the different assets that are available and uh, uh, the, uh, essentially some of the different outcome uh, endpoints that we use in studies, what is the impact of sensitization and transplant outcomes? We all know that having an elevated CPRA or calculated PRA uh, essentially decreases the chances of transplant because you have a uh, uh, the lower chance of finding a viable donor in a donor pool. Unfortunately, as a result of this, um, the more time is spent on the wait list, and there's going to be a higher chance for wait list mortality, and on, in some cases, death, depending on the organ. And more specifically, um, stratifying based on organs, um, across the board, you see that there's going to be a higher chance for rejection. Uh, there's going to be an increased chance of some form of um, chronic rejection, be it um, cardiac allograph vasculopathy in the heart transplant population or CLAD, which is chronic lung allograph dysfunction. So sensitization essentially is bad to some degree, but the question is, should we see still, is it still uh, worth attempting to desensitize some patients? 
So who exactly would be a good candidate for desensitization? Before this can happen, we need to stratify what the goals are. And the ultimate goal for desensitization is to increase the donor pool by decreasing the number of unacceptable antigen, which ultimately reduces the CPRA. And the other goal is to decrease the, uh, the number of known donor-specific antibodies prior to plan uh, positive cross matches. So for don't live in donor cases for kidneys, for example. So in terms of consensus statements, uh, the ISHLT, which is the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplants, um, um, ha have several guidelines out, but unfortunately there's no consensus in, in terms of uh, favoring or not favoring desensitization. Um, the conference participants from the heart transplant standpoint agreed that it would be beneficial if all, uh, all transplant centers actually utilize a similar protocol to allow for co fair comparisons and randomized controlled trials to actually assess the benefit of treatment in these patients pre and post transplant. The same thing is true in the lung transplant population is there is no consensus. Uh, and the one thing they mentioned in their guideline is that interventions may reduce MFI without altering or reducing the CPRA. And one thing that's also very important to note is that rebound is very post likely. And these transplants are unscheduled, which means uh, just desensitizing the patient and having to wait for a transplant without knowing the optimal timing might be uh, unbeneficial. And to this note, uh, one thing that was pointed out in that uh, consensus statement was that perioperative desensitization, which was done by Tink and uh, the Toronto group, might actually be something that's viable in some of these patient populations. So switching and going below the diaphragm here in terms of kidney transplant populations, who uh, can get, uh, who benefits uh, from a kidney transplantation or who benefits, excuse me, from desensitization. In 2014, the allocation system was actually uh, changed to favor uh, patients that are uh, highly sensitized. In a sense, uh, it's a gradient, as you can see in the, uh, the graphic to the right, that shows that was CPRA greater than 80 uh, up to about greater to 100 more and more points are awarded to actually move and increase priority for these patients. And that's something we don't have in the cardiothoracic counterparts. Despite this allocation changes, um, there's still a shortage of organs with unique HLA that are compatible with this recipients. And one thing that, all, that was also uh, implemented was um, the kidney peer donation, which essentially uh, provides patients that are highly sensitized uh, a better uh, match by uh, utilizing and swapping um, organs, essentially. Despite this being done, patients that are highly sensitized that have a CPR of 99 or above are still unable to find donors. Excuse me. So what exactly is the survival? Since we're talking, we're having a little bit of a, a internal dialogue about um, doing uh, desensitization in tra kidney transplant recipients. Is there a difference in terms of uh, patients being desensitized or just remaining on dialysis and just waiting on the allocation system to do its job? And this question was um, uh, answered by Montgomery and colleagues when they compared sensitized patients. Uh, uh, they either received desensitization treatment and, be and became transplanted. Uh, sensitized patients that remained on dialysis or just waited for the allocation system to kick in and for them to get an offer. Or uh, sensitized patients who re remained on dialysis. And as you can tell by this capital myon curve here, there's a clear separations that patients who actually receive desensitization treat, um, therapy actually end up doing better. And on that note, uh, uh, here is a proposed um, algorithm for patients that might actually benefit in terms, despite the KPD and also the new allocation system. So candidates that are approved for living donor kidney transplantation, but have a CPR greater than 90, uh, 98, with no compatible offer via KPD might benefit from desensitization. Candidates with CPR greater than 99% might benefit from desensitization. And candidates that have a CPR greater than 98% but have been on a wait list for over five years may also benefit from desensitization. So in summary, uh, for my section, uh, anti-HLA antibodies are bad. <laughs> they increase time on the wait list. Uh, we have several serological assays, which are constantly and constantly evolving to estimate sensitization. There's no consensus uh, to the sensitization in cardiothoracic organs, so it just depends on centers. Some centers are more willing to accept the risk, whereas others might be a little bit more err uh, on the side of caution. And last but not least, the need for desensitization in kidney transplant has reduced for a subset of these candidates to still benefit from desensitization. <laughs>
And with this, I'll hand it over to Dr. Vo to talk about emerging therapies for desensitization. Thank you so much, Moses. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, uh, Ricky Evans and the ACCP committee for the invitation to speak with you today. Uh, I'd also like to thank, thank Chris uh, for moderating and Moses, my co-presenter. Um, so as you heard from Moses um, on the immunology of sensitization, uh, what I'd like to do next is to share with you emerging therapies for desensitization. My objectives are to review the cedar sinai transplant experience with our desensitization protocol, um, to share with you outcomes as well as safety, uh, to review our criteria for acceptance of transplant offers, and then to review with you novel approaches for desensitization and for prevention and treatment of AVMR. So first, I'd like to start out with uh, sharing with you our Cedar sinai Center's experience with desensitization. We started out with using high-dose IVIG in the early 90s um, as a desensitization for treatment of uh, rejection, uh, specifically antibody rejection. And then we went into desensitization with AVOI and HLAI. And then in 2005, we used a combination of IVIG rituximab. Uh, and then from 2013 uh, to current, we use uh, anti-IL-6 therapy as well as the IgG degrading enzyme. And throughout this presentation, uh, I will share with you our center's experience with uh, those novel agents. So first, I'd like to start out with the, um, um, the story of um, using uh, IVIG as a desensitization agent. This was based on our NIH IGO2 study um, that was published in 2004. So this was a, a second uh, NIH sponsor study that uh, Dr. Jordan, our medical director, received from the NIH. And uh, the aim of the study was to evaluate IVIG as a desensitization agent um, in lowering HLA antibody. And so the primary objective at that time uh, for this study was reduction of HLA antibody. The patients who were enrolled in the study had to have a mean a PRA of about, at the, at the time it was a PRA of more than 50%, but the mean PRA at study entry for these patients were more than 80%. And the protocol at that time was monthly IVIG for four months, and then at 12 months and at 24 months if they did not receive a transplant. And as I mentioned, our primary objective was to see if IVIG could reduce HLA antibody. And the objective was not a rate of transplant, but if you look at the figure on the left where um, uh, it shows that, that IVIG patients uh, had a 35% transplant rate compared to 17% in the placebo group. Um, and then looking at the figures on the right at the top, uh, IVIG reduced uh, both um, IgG and IgM HLA antibody as well as IgG. IgG antibody. So in, in this trial, we show that that 35% of the patients who were randomized to receive IVIG were able to receive a transplant. In addition to that rate of transplant uh, seen with the IVIG, we also show or saw that those patients that got IVIG waited an average of about 4.5 years um, to transplant, whereas the placebo group waited an average of about 10.7 years. So at that time, if a sensitized patient received IVIG, the wait time the transplant was similar to that of the low immunologic risk patient. And then in 2005, we um, conducted an investigator-initiated trial um, that was a pilot study using the combination of IVIG and metuximab for desensitization. And in this study, the protocol was to give two doses of IVIG um, four weeks apart, and then two doses of rituximab at week one and week three. So we said sandwiching between the two doses IVIG. So it was a four-week desensitization protocol compared to the NIH IGO2, it was four months. And um, the patients, uh, we enrolled 20 patients. Uh, the mean PRA pre-study entry was 77%. And after the um, last dose of IVIG, which is four weeks later, the mean PRA was reduced to 40%. So that's what we saw with the high-dose IVIG. Um, uh, in the IGO2 also. However, with regards to rate of transplant, of the 20 patients that were enrolled, we were able to transplant 16 out of 20 or 80%. So from this uh, protocol, we can safely say that that IVIG and rituximab significantly lower the PRA levels and improve transplant rates in 80% of the highly sensitized patients uh, that were treated with this combination. We also looked at the efficacy outcomes and cost effectiveness of desensitization with IVIG and rituximab. And what we show here is that for a deceased donor, 
uh, recipient who await for uh, transplant on the wait list. With desensitization, we can actually transplant 60% of those patients um, during this three-year period where we um, analyze the data. And if you look at a similar group of patients who uh, had CPRA, or excuse me, PRA at the time of 80% or higher who did not receive desensitization, the rate of transplant for those patients is less than 10%. With regards to uh, rate of transplant for living donor, we could transplant 80% of our patient with the combination of IVIG and rituximab. Whereas um, a similar group of patients who had living donor but did not receive desensitization, their rate of transplant while waiting on UNOS list is 2%. So as you can see that that desensitization allows transplantation in these PRA more than 80%, um, for DD 60% and for living donor 80%. But more importantly, when we look at the cumulative probability of death in the highly sensitized patients who remain on dialysis, as you show, you saw the slide shown by Moses earlier uh, from Dr. Montgomery's group, um, you can see that, that the patients that stay on dialysis, their mortality is 18 to 22% uh, during those three-year period. Whereas if our patient uh, receive desensitization and then transplanted, their mortality is 3.4%. And in 2011, when we did this um, analysis, we show that for each patient that was desensitized and transplanted, we were saving the U.S., um, uh, healthcare of almost $19,000 a year per patient after the first year of transplant. So what I want to do next is to show you how do we, um, what do we use uh, as our criteria for acceptance for transplant offers. Um, the um, uh, x-axis is the flow cross match and the y-axis is the MFA, um, MFI of the DSA. So um, if you look at the flow cross match, that's around 200 mean channel shift and the DSA, that's about 9,000 MFI. We know that that AMR is unlikely in that range. However, if we accept a flow cross match that's around 250 or or so and a DSA that's about 10,000 10, or so, we know that AMR is likely. And if we accept a flow cross match of 300 or higher, we know that that is associated with a CDC positive cross match. And we also know that that CDC positive cross match is a contraindication to transplant. So we would not go uh, above um, 225 to 250 as our acceptable cross match um, to proceed to transplant. And with that said, we also look at factors that predict the risk for ABMR uh, and graft loss in our sensitized patient who receive desensitization and then transplanted. And we developed this scale called the DSA Relative Intensity Scale, where we assign points um, based on the strength of the MFI. So I don't know if you can see from the bottom there, um, if a patient had an MFI that's less than 5,000, we gave that two points. If the MFI is between 5,000 to 10,000, that gets five points. And if the MFI is more than 10,000, that gets 10 points. So if you look at the figure on the left, looking at patients who develop a BMR, they have a significantly higher uh, number of DSA relative intensity score compared to those that did not have a BMR. Also, when you look at the figure on the right, we can have, we can say that we can predict a BMR in a patient if they have a DSA relative intensity score of 17 or higher. And this ROC curve shows that, that we can predict with 91% positive predictive value for risk of ABMR if the DSA relative intensity score is 17 or higher. So this is our algorithm for management of the highly sensitized patients. Patients will come to us, we said, you know, a um, conservative 30% or higher uh, with sensitizing events. We will desensitize them with IVIG rituximab. And then if uh, they don't have a living donor, they'll have to wait uh, for a deceased donor. So they will have to wait for six months because the half-life of rituximab is uh, about six months. So uh, with that said, we um, they wait for six months. And if they don't have a deceased donor offer that's acceptable, that allows them to proceed to transplantation, then they will undergo retreatment. Um, the next step of desensitization um, uh, beyond the IVIG rituximab is with pharesis. And then IVIG rituximab after pharesis or IVIG and tocilizumab uh, after pharesis. And I'll show you some of our um, data uh, with those combination. So at the time of the offer, they have to have a negative CDC. They also, um, if they have a flow cross match that is positive, but cannot be more than 200 to 225 mean channel shift for T or B flow, then we would accept that. 
Also, if they have DSA, the DSA relative intensity score needs to be less than seventeen because we the paper that I show you on the previous slide、um, predict ABMR if the DSA RAS is seventeen or higher. And so we would transplant these patients. They would receive induction with CAMPATH, and we would give them IVIG again after transplant to prevent rebound. And if the last dose of Ritux during the desensitization was greater than six months, and then we、we'll, then we would give them another dose of Ritux. And then for post transplant, if they have ABMR, we、uh, with mild ABMR we would use IVIG rituximab. With the severe form of ABMR, which、um, is、uh, with TMA, then we would do phoresis,、um, eculizumab, and then IVIG. And then for those patients that have persistent DSA or TG, we would use、uh, tocilizumab、um, as our treatment、um, for TG. So the patients,、um, our patients, come to us、uh, to undergo desensitization and and then、um, uh, got transplanted、uh, based on our、um, uh, criteria for acceptance for、um, uh, offers. What about the impact of desensitization on antiviral immunity? So Dr. Toyota、uh, from our group, who、um, uh, is now retired, but she、uh, at the time was the director of our transplant immunology lab. She looked at this、um, uh, group of patients、um, that. Were desensitized, which is our patients, and there were 370 plus patients、uh, that were in the desensitized group. And she compared their outcomes to the non-desensitized patient, who were also our patient, but they did not require desensitization. And there were 500 plus patients in the non-desensitized group. And she just looked at the rates of CMV, EBV, and BK viremia、uh, between the two groups. So here, what you can see is that for our desensitized patient,、uh, with regards to CMV. EBV, there、uh, were significantly less、um, incidence of CMV and EBV in the desensitized patients, so therefore、um, in a higher、uh, freedom from CMV viremia in the desensitized group. There were no difference in the BK、um, viremia between the two groups,、um, but we believe that that the reason why we saw less. CMV and EBV in our sensitized patient is because we do do antiviral prophylaxis, we do PCR monitoring quarterly for the first year and then annually thereafter. We check for their presence of memory T cells. We check for their antibody to CMV. We do use IVIG after transplant to prevent rebound, and we do know that IVIG contains antiviral properties. And then we use rituxase、um, desensitization, which can can eliminate the reservoirs of um, um, EBV. In the B cells, so those are、um, possible、uh, are factors that that contribute to、uh, lower incidence of CMV and EBV in our desensitized patients. What about the impact of viral infection on、uh, allograft rejection? So you can what you can see here is that overall rejection were similar between the desensitized and the non-desensitized group. Um, the CMV, excuse me, CMR was also、uh, not different between the、uh, sensitized and non-sensitized、uh, group. However, when we look at a BMR, of course, you know these are sensitized patients, so they are known to have higher rates of a BMR. So therefore, as you can see there,、uh, a BMR was higher in the desensitized patient compared to the non-desensitized patient. But when you look at patient and graft survival, which is the last two graphs on the lower right, there were no difference, significant differences between the patient. And, and the graft survival for the desensitized and the non-desensitized patients. So these patients do very well, and that、um, IVIG rituximab combination as a desensitization agent with CAMPATH induction with triple regimen、uh, did not increase the risk of CMV, EBV, or BK in our desensitized patients. So what I like to do now is to shift gear、um, to discuss novel therapeutics, and the first category of novel therapeutics are the IL-6、uh, and IL-6 receptor blockade. So as you know, IL-6A is a pleiotropic cytokine that impacts multiple organ system,、um, and, and IL-6 has effects virtually on all body system. And any abnormality in production of IL-6 will create、uh, multiple pathogenic responses, which include chronic inflammation, immune stimulation, as well as neovascular. Um, vascularization. So when you look at the effect of IL-6 on the immune cell,、uh, which is on top here, IL-6 stimulates B cell differentiation、uh, and thereby、uh, producing plasma cell.、Um, it also increases Th17 and TFH cells.、Um, and then with regards to the effect of IL-6 on the liver,、uh, it increases CRP, increases serum amyloid A,、uh, fibrinogen, as well as hepcidin. And hepcidin is what is known to cause anemia in chronic diseases. And then with regards 
In regards to IL-6 effect on the kidney, it causes increase in mesangial um, proliferation as well as um, contributor to uh, chronic allograft um, uh, rejection in the um, kidney allograft. So IL-6 drives B cell um, activation and differentiation to antibody producing plasma cells. IL-6 is a powerful stimulator of IL-21 production in the naive T cells. Uh, this initiates maturation toward TFH cells that expresses CXCR5, IL-21, as well as uh, the transcription factor of BCL6. Naive B cells are also drawn to the germinal center by CXCR5 and then proceed to development of plasma blast. And plasma blasts are known to produce a copious amount of IL-6. Um, and then um, that um, further um, initiates more germinal center formation of TFH stimulation as well as germinal center formation of the B cells. So these plasma cells then are known to um, cause, um, patho are known to be pathogenic antibody. They can cause tissue injury and then can cause um, uh, uh, decrease in EGFR as um, presented by um, chronic antibody rejection. So if you use IL-6 therapy to, to block um, um, the IL-6, then that will lead to decrease in pathogenic antibodies, uh, production, decrease in tissue injury, and then improve uh, EGFR. This slide shows the IL-6 signaling and its blockade. So IL-6 signaling consists of IL-6 receptor media classic signaling and IL-6 soluble um, uh, receptor uh, mediated trans signaling. In the classic signaling, IL-6 has to bind to IL-6 receptor. That in turn will activate GP-130, which will lead to signal transduction, as well as um, uh, um, for gene transcription and, and just that activation. Uh, classic signaling um, is um, activated on cells that are leukocytes, apotocytes, or hepatocytes, whereas the um, trans signaling uh, pathway occurs when you have binding of IL-6 to soluble IL-6 receptor. And here in this trans signaling pathway, there's a lot of GP-1 that are expressed ubiquitously. So any uh, cells that, that have um, um, uh, uh, GP130 that are not leukocyte, not podocytes, or not hepatocytes, they bind um, to, to, they can activate GP130. And, um, and so there are studies that show that that classic signaling promotes anti-inflammatory effect, whereas trans signaling promotes pro-inflammatory effect. Um, so how does tocilizumab work? It works by preventing the binding of IL-6 to IL-6 receptor. So it inhibits both the classic signaling as well as the um, trans-signaling pathway. And clazakizumab work by uh, preventing the uh, production of IL-6 ligand. So it inhibits um, the, also both the classic signaling as well as the trans-signaling um, pathway. So our initial um, experience with uh, anti-IL-6 therapy was in this mouse model of allocentization, where Dr. Kim, uh, who's now our head of our, our um, comprehensive transplant center, um, did this basic science study where she looked at C57 black 6 mice um, and, um, and uh, re-exposed them to uh, HLA-A2 uh, skin allograft. And as you know, um, for a sensitizing event upon re-exposure of an antigen, uh, here in this case, it, an A2 antigen, um, you know that, that the um, uh, animal will make um, IgG-producing antibody. So with treatment of um, anti-IL-6, you can see that in the bone marrow in the spleen, um, the figure on the bottom, uh, in the top, but on the bottom, uh, sorry, in the middle, is that anti-IL-6 treatment decreased the IgG-producing cells in the bone marrow and the spleen. And using the mousinized version of the anti-IL-6 um, receptor blocker called uh, MMR-16, um, she also saw that there was reduction in the IgG-producing plasma cells in the bone marrow and the spleen compared to the control. And then also, if um, adding, just by adding the MMR-16 to the media, um, that also reduced the MFI compared to the untreated uh, media. So um, uh, what we're seeing here in this basic science a mouse model of um, um, re-exposure of the skin allograft is that anti-IL-6 treatment reduced the TH17, reduced TFH cells, and increases Treg cells. So we took that experience to um, using tocilizumab um, as a desensitization agent in a highly sensitized patients who await for a kidney transplant.
And this was a phase one tube trial that um, uh, uses tocilizumab, again, is an interleukin-6 receptor blocker, and IVIG in difficult to desensitize patients. And what we mean by difficult is that these patients, uh, there were 10 patients in this study. These 10 patients had undergone desensitization with IVIG rituximab and still were not able to receive a transplant. So that's the term difficult. So of these 10 patients that were enrolled, we were able to transplant five of the 10 or 50 percent of the difficult to desensitize patient. And if you look at the mean time to, to um, a transplant from first desensitization, it was 25 months before um, during the desensitization before they get to transplant. However, after they were treated with TCZ, um, the mean time to transplant was eight months. So we reduced the time uh, to transplant uh, with TCZ. And that's what enables us to transplant 50% of these difficult to desensitize patients. Uh, when we look at the course of the immunodominant DSA using the um, DSA relative intensity intensity um, scale, um, you can see that at pretreatment, there were DSA relative intensity um, scores that were high um, in these five patients um, that were transplanted. But at transplant, the DSA um, score was reduced. And then at 12 month post-transplant, the score was reduced even more. And in fact, if anything, at 12 months, there was one patient who had persistent DSA, and these were uh, the two that was an A2 and an A29, but the strength of these uh, DSAs were weak DSA. And then when you look at the mean immunodominant DSARIS on the right, there were significant reduction in the DSA relative intensity score at transplant and then at 12-month post-transplant. Uh, post so we show that tocilizumab um, work and that targeting uh, the IL-6 and IL-6 receptor pathway could offer a novel alternative to difficult to desensitize patients. Currently, um, we um, conducted another investigator-initiated trial um, that's a phase one two using clazakizumab. So I share with you, clazakizumab is a um, IL-6 ligand blocker. So we're doing this study to uh, as a, um, using clazakizumab as a desensitization agent in a highly sensitized patient. So the patients that are eligible for the study would uh, have a CPR of more than 50%. Um, the protocol is pharesis, high-dose IVIG at the end of the fifth pharesis, and then clazakizumab sep-Q monthly for six months. And the patient will be in the study for nine months. So of the 20 patients that were enrolled uh, with clazakizumab, we were able to transplant 18 out of 20 or 90% with this protocol. 60% um, of the patients that were in the study had CPR of 99 to 100%. And 10 of the 18 had positive flow cross matches um, at the time of transplant. So this, when we look at this data um, to show the mean class one by MFI category um, at NEET and at one to eight pre and post class, um, um, when we look at the MFI category, um, we show that um, uh, less than 5,000 MFI, between 5,000 to 10,000 MFI and greater than 10,000, you can see that that post class, uh, there were significant reduction in the category at uh, less than 5,000 and greater than 10,000. Um, at both NEAT and at uh, 1 to 8 dilution. However, for the um, MFI that's between 5,000 and 10,000, we saw a significant reduction at NEAT but did not see significant reduction uh, at the uh, 1 to 8 dilution. Similarly, we saw a very similar effect um, of uh, CLASA uh, post-treatment where there were significant reduction in the MFI with each of the category at NEAT as well as the uh, 1 to 8 dilution. So these reductions were associated with pre-desensitization titer and that there's more efficient uh, reduction in the MFI observed with lower pre desensitization um, uh, levels. However, you know, I show you that, that uh, there were reductions that were seen across the board, um, especially in the um, level of the um, strong um, HLA uh, titer, um, which at this level is where it is known to be um, the one that, that prevents um, a transplant from occurring because of um, a high MFI. 
And then, uh, as I said, 10 of the 18 patients had um, uh, flow cross match positivity at the time of transplant, and 14 of the 18 had DSA uh, at the time of transplant. And these are their DSA, MFI, pre-desensitization at transplant and after 12 months post-transplant. And you can see here that, that at 12 months, only one patient uh, had persistent DSA. And this was a class 2 DSA with a 5,000 MFI. Uh, and this patient did have antibody rejection uh, after transplant. So from this um, uh, study, pilot study of 20 patients that were enrolled, uh, we feel that that clazakizumab desensitization resulted in significant reduction in the number and the intensity of HLA class 1 and class 2 specificities and allow 18 out of 20 to be transplanted. And currently, um, I'm, uh, I just submitted the resubmission to AJT this morning, so we'll see how it goes um, with the resubmission. Um, the next category of um, novel therapeutic is um, uh, based on a virulent factor that is made by uh, strep pyogenes, um, and that agent is uh, itis or amlifidase. So as you know, strep pyogenes um, is responsible for life-threatening diseases and kill 5,000 patients uh, each year um, with this condition. And um, Hansa Biopharma uh, developed um, IDAS or IgG degrading enzyme by using strep pyogenes um, uh, uh, made enzyme to remove the HLA antibody that, that's a barrier to transplantation. So if you look at the figure um, on the, the lower bottom uh, on the left, where um, one hour after IDIS administration, you can see the antibody is single cleave. And by single cleaving that antibody, you can inhibit CDC. And then six hours after itis, uh, you can see that the IgG is completely um, uh, uh, detached where you see FAB and FC fragment um, uh, by itself. So by um, um, causing the IgG to be um, detached, um, itis inhibits both CDC and ADCC six hour after administration. The figure on the right looks at the effect of itis um, on uh, HLA specificity for class one. And six hour after itis, um, you can see that there were a reduction in the specificity and almost um, uh, elimination of the specificity. And the figure on the bottom right looks at the effect of um, itis on C1Q binding. And you can see that, that um, after one hour uh, of itis, the C1Q binding specificities are almost completely eliminated. So in the New England paper that we published in 2017, uh, it was based on outcomes of 25 patients, uh, but it was a combined um, data from the Swedish cohort and the U.S. cohort. In the Swedish um, cohort, there were 11 patients. Uh, IDAS was given as a 15-minute uh, infusion, four to six hours prior to surgery. Uh, the, in the Swedish cohort, they use uh, horse ATG or ADGAM as an induction therapy, and IDAS will not um, uh, digest horse ATG, but it will digest the rabbit ATG or thymo and will digest Campath or alemtuzumab. So in the U.S. cohort, we um, had to wait till post-op day number four to give Campath uh, as an induction. Uh, the half-life of itis is about 8 to 12 hours, and then um, it uh, can be eliminated in 24 hours. However, there are still some activity of itis up to four days post-transplant, and that's the reason why we waited uh, till post-op day four to um, give the induction. And the other difference in the U.S. cohort is that we gave IVIG rituximab after transplant to prevent rebound. So here, the figure C on the left looks at the SES page, which looks at the um, IgG um, component, and then the Western blot on the bottom looks at the FAB and FC fragment. So what you can see here is that pre-itis, the IgG is intact. But one hour after itis, the, um, it's a single cleave. So you can see the band here. And then six hours after itis, all you will see is the FAB and FC fragment um, that is noted here. Now, we did, we, as I mentioned, we do give IVIG after transplant. Uh, so this is um, this band of IgG here is the due to the exogenous administration of IVIG. And these are four patients that, that um, uh, had this um, process done um, in the U.S. 
on the figure on the right, it looks at the effect of itis on circulating IgG in the um, 10 of the Swedish patients. And you can see here that after itis administration in the first seven days, there were no IgG um, um, detected at all. And that these um, the IgG level uh, still remain um, uh, reduced uh, after 28 days uh, post um, itis administration. Here we look at the donor-specific antibody levels in the individual patients in the Swedish group and the U.S. group. But if I could bring your attention uh, to the right, where if you look at the Swedish group, there uh, there were rebounds, significant rebounds seen at one month post-treatment. However, in the U.S. group, we did not see any uh, rebound uh, at the one month post-treatment. And again, we believe that this is because we gave IVIG rituximab uh, after transplant to prevent the rebound. As another um, uh, IDIS study is called the HIDIS, and it's the result of an international phase two trial. So the participating centers were from um, uh, France and Sweden uh, in Europe. And then in the U.S., um, participating centers were us and um, Johns Hopkins uh, when Dr. Montgomery was there at the time. So the patients uh, have to have a positive cross-match MDSA at the time of um, enrollment, and then they would get IDIS. Uh, treatment and then repeat cross-match at two hours, six hours, and 24 hours after itis. And then they could proceed to transplant if the cross-match converts to negative. The patients are also um, uh, uh, receiving um, IVIG rituximab uh, after transplant, and then they will be in the study for six months with a protocol biopsy at six months. So the figure on the bottom looks at the effect of the DSA over the six month period. As you can see that, that you know, in the first uh, 48 hours, there were significant reduction in the DSA. Um, but we did see DSA rebound at uh, starting as early as day three out to day 64 post-transplant. There were um, uh, six patients or seven patients out of the uh, 18 uh, in the study that had um, antibody rejection, so about 40%. But with that said, you know, we um, uh, believe that the amlifidase converted positive cost matches uh, in these patients to negative that allowed them to be transplanted. And the patients that were in this study had a CPI of 99.8. They were able to um, proceed to kidney transplant, and they had good kidney function as well as graft survival at six months. And so to date, there have been 39 patients um, in both Europe and U.S. that have received amlifidase or IDIS as a desensitization agent. And this paper um, recently published um, in HAT um, was on outcomes at three years post-transplant in amlifidase desensitized kidney transplant patients. And what I thought was interesting to share was that in this paper, they did a sub-analysis of patients who were the very difficult to desensitize, right? The 99.9 .9 and greater. And yet they saw that, that the subgroup of patients were able to convert a positive cross-match to a negative cross-match and then transplant it. And, um, and post-transplant, they had the figures on the right looks at the patient survival, graph survival, EGFR at three years. They were acceptable, um, even though we do know that, that these patients are at more risk of ABMR, so there was a higher rate of ABMR. So um, we, again, feel that imlifidase is a potent option to facilitate transplantation among these patients that have significant immunologic barrier to successful kidney transplantation. And in fact, if anything, uh, HANSA now has a new study that they're going to do, uh, which is the use of IDIS as a desensitization agent in the CPR of more than 99.9 .9, and to a, one of the, uh, the participating center for this trial. So in conclusion, um, what I share with you today um, is um, the approaches to desensitization um, and the emerging therapies to desensitization. And we do know that management of the HLA-sensitized patients represents one of the greatest challenges to transplant medicine. Much progress has been made in removing the immunologic barriers to transplantation through desensitization. Our group, among others, have developed desensitization protocols that result in acceptable kidney graft survival and have shown to offer a survive, survival advantage compared to remaining on dialysis. And desensitization of the highly sensitized patients who await for both LD and DD is effective and allow significantly greater number of patients to be transplanted um, compared to um, remaining on dialysis.
So with that, I would like to conclude this presentation. Thank you very much for uh, listening and participating in this webinar today. And I, um, I will answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Welcome everybody to the uh, end of the spoken portion of our um, of our moderated debate here. There's one question um, from Georgina. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and I think this one's mostly directed to Ashley. Uh, Ashley, can you please comment on the clinical application of itis and cardiothoracic organs where you did not have four to six hours, perhaps to wait prior to surgery? Um, and then whether or not you think there, uh, what, whether or not you think this, what the significance might be of the risk of cellular rejection um, in the four days after itis for the delayed induction process. Okay, so let me take that second question first. So with our first patient in the itis study, you know, because we had to wait for four days, we did see CMR in that first patient. And so we changed our protocol to give um, solumedrol 250 daily till day four until we can give the camp path. So yes, you will see CMR if you're not doing anything else um, outside of, uh, if, if you're delaying the induction. With regards to uh, cardiothoracic, I, I, I am certain that, that when this drug is approved, um, uh, for use in the U.S., uh, that it will be um, studied in um, organs that are outside of the kidney. Um, as you know, you know, the the uh, heart transplant patients who are on VAD, for example, um, as a not as a bridge therapy, but as a, um, a while waiting for a heart transplant, those patients receive a lot of blood, right? And they are sensitized and they require desensitization. Well, um, you know, it's um, for kidney, if they don't get a transplant, they can stay on dialysis. And for heart transplant, if they if VAD is not a destin, uh, destination therapy, they need a heart, otherwise they die. And so at our center, our uh, heart transplant program do do desensitization for these highly sensitized patients that are waiting for a heart transplant. And they would love to get their hands on IDIS uh, if they could. Now, the reason why we said four to six hours prior to um, uh, the surgery is because, you know, you need to give IDIS time to work. And I show you the data that at one hour, you can block C1Q, right? But And that's the IgG is single cleave. You need that six hour uh, time to allow the uh, IgG to be completely um, separated into the FAB and FC fragment. So, you know, you, you do need to have that time to allow the drug to work, for it to work. Right. Um, I see that a couple of y'all have popped a question um, into the chat, but I don't see the text of the question. Um, so feel free to retype the question into the presenter um, section of the chat, um, and I will make sure that that gets over to um, our presenters. While the um, audience is typing in um, the questions, I would like to find out if um, if, um, if there are centers out there that are doing desensitization for their highly sensitized patients. Um, and uh, if so, um, you know, are you uh, eliminating um, the ones that have the CPR at 99.9? Because as you know, those are the very difficult to cross that barrier. I'm just well, curious. I can, I, can, I can certainly comment on my own experience, Ashley. Um, and, and it somewhat goes into the next question, um, which is also directed for you. Um, and, and I already know your opinions on, on this answer, so I'm going to chuckle a little bit. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I just, I just desensitized uh, a heart-lung transplant candidate um, after uh, eight sessions of plasma exchange, IVIG, and carfilzomib, uh, who went from having 30 unacceptables to um, completely uh, clean from a desensitization perspective, so CPRA of 99 to zero. Um, and which is now durable out to 42 days. Um, she's young, has hokum, um, and needs a heart lung for associated pulmonary hypertension with her uh, hokum, has had a myectomy twice, um, and has three kids. And so her, her sensitization is entirely pregnancy related, but um, had a very lovely outcome. The question, on the other hand, um, from V, 
and like I said, I already know your opinion on this, so so I'll chuckle a bit. Um, which is, what's your opinion on uh, bortezomib versus tocilizumab <laughs> for AMR treatment and desensitization? You can answer that question for me then, if you already know my opinion. Um, you know, uh, we we um, are not uh, a center with. Um, the proteasome inhibitor. We had a few experience with, um, uh, not for desensitization, but for treatment of um, ABMR in a 20-year-old patient who had her fourth transplant. Um, and there were more uh, side effects associated with it um, than the um, uh, uh, positive outcome that we were hoping to see. So on a limited experience of one patient, we are not using uh, proteasome inhibitors for desensitization or for treatment. However, with that said, our heart and heart team does um, use proteasome inhibitors for as a next step of desensitization. So they'll do IVIG rituximab, and then they would go to phoresis, um, and then um, uh, bortezomib, uh, or I'm not sure if they're using carfilzomib yet, but they I know they were using bortezomib um, for the as a next round of desensitization in the heart patients awaiting for transplant. Yeah, Jig has used uh, has used carfilzomib a handful of times, but uh, but not a ton. Their their preference is to borts. Uh, let's see. Um, I saw I saw another alert that said a question was added, but I still don't see it. I do see a response from Georgina, though, um, that um, the Mass General is participating in the duet desensitization trial along with um, with your center uh, for um, uh, eculizumab based desensitization. So to get back to your question. Thank you. Ricky, are you seeing these questions that are getting uh, popped in here? I am not. I was going to ask the group maybe to try and post them in the attendee chat for everyone and see if that will work. Okay. We probably have a, have time for a, a question or two left. Well, seeing no additional questions. Oh, hey, there we go. <laughs> uh, Tatiana uh, has asked a question, um, and, and I can also uh, share my thoughts as well. Um, the question is thoughts on uh, daratumumab. Um, and um, so I have used daratumumab uh, at least a dozen times now um, in treatment and desensitization. Um, I will typically not start with daratumumab. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as a, as I sort of chuckled at Ashley a little bit, my, my standard approach to both treatment and desensitization is pretty some inhibitor based, almost exclusively carfilzomib based. Um, and so if you, if we have, uh, patients who have recurrent antibody mediated rejection after treatment with, uh, IVIG, uh, plasma exchange and CFZ, um, we will progress to adding daratumumab to those patients um, in in a second round. Um, I, I presented a case on this at um, at Ashi. Oh, geez, three years ago now, the last in person meeting, whatever it was, um, <clears throat> about a, a young a young woman uh, who had CF, who required lung transplantation, who had a couple of kids, um, who had reasonable response to. Plasma exchange, IVIG, carfilzomib, uh, but the response was not durable, um, and so very quickly developed rebound sensitization, um, was desensitized again, was transplanted, developed early AMR, um, was treated with um, plasma exchange, IVIG, carfilzomib plus daratumumab, um, and had very nice response with durable um, antibody depletion. Uh, she's almost three years out now, uh, living a great life uh, with. Her or allographs. So, um, and, you know, like I said, I've, I've used daratumumab a handful of times now. The toxicity is is minimal at best. Um, the problem with daratumumab and the reason I don't use it alone um, is because um, it's a big monoclonal antibody. So just like rituximab, it will only take care of cells that are circulating. Um, so you miss the immunologic niches and all this sort of stuff. So I tend not to use it alone. 
Um, but then again, I am a proteasome inhibitor advocate, so mm -hmm. um, because of the immunologic niches. Um, but at least for me, um, it has it has been reasonably effective as an add-on to therapy um, for uh, patients who have refractory um, AMR or recurrent uh, sensitization. Um, we used it on the original multiple myeloma schedule <clears throat> um, for the course of our desensitization treatment because there's no sort of stop date or regimen in myeloma. So we gave it for, um, we gave uh, 400 milligrams essentially on a, on a weight-based dose, but almost everybody gets 400 milligrams um, times two days on days one, two, eight, nine, 15, and 16, along with 20 milligrams per meter squared of carfilzomib. Um, and the toxicities of that regimen mirror the toxicities of carfilzomib. So there's no sort of add-on uh, toxicity from daratumumab that at least have seen in my hands. Have either of you guys used uh, any daratumumab? Uh, Moses, no. Uh, Cedars we have in, in very limited capacity as well uh, for desensitization. Um, we just uh, we recently uh, treated four patients uh, who have failed all of our approaches that, that I've described to you um, in this presentation. And so daratumumab was the next step. So the phoresis, IVIG, and then weekly dara for four doses, and that's it. We just wait. Um, and we haven't, uh, these patients were treated in the last three months, so we haven't seen uh, any effect yet uh, and have not transplanted these, uh, any one of these four patients. We have treated one patient um, with daratumumab um, a couple years ago who was, this was our third transplant, had antibody rejection after transplant with MFIs, you know, in the 15 to 17,000. Um, and um, we treated with our traditional, oh, with ecolizumab, for reasons IVIG ecolizumab didn't work, so DARA was the next step that we went to. And with that said, we saw a reduction in the MFI, but went from 17,000 down to 15. Um, you know, she um, responded somewhat based on that reduction in the MFI, but she had cell media rejection. So in post-transplant um, uh, patients that are getting DARA for ABMR, you do have to worry about the uh, cell media component. So we had to treat her with thymol for the cell media component. So that's an NF1 for post-transplant and NF4 for desensitization at our center. That's, a, that's actually a great point, Ashley. Um, we did substantially increase the prednisone that we give with carfilzomib. Um, we, so we typically give 40 milligrams of prednisone prior to carfilzomib to avoid the infusion-related stuff. Um, and when we add daratumumab to the regimen, we change the prednisone to 250 of medrol mm -hmm. to, um, to, to knock down the T-cell activating effect of daratumumab. Um, but that's a great point that I, I should mention about the patients that we have treated. Um, and as a consequence, so they get about a, a gram and a half of medrol over the course of a 16 day um, regimen um, if they get there to a med. But we, we've not seen um, uh, the cellular rejection problem that we expected to see um, in the lung transplant patient. Yeah. All Thank right. You. Well, I think we're over our time. Uh, my great thanks to Ashley and Moses for sticking around for a few extra minutes to take a couple of questions. Apologies for some of the difficulty we had with the questions to the audience. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure for me to uh, see my good friends, Ashley and Moses, um, and share their information with the rest of y'all. So thank you very much to Ashley and Moses, and we'll see you guys for the next webinar. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Take care. Yeah. <clears throat>